Welcome, everyone. My name is Jim Turk, and I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University. And I want to welcome you to the second in the Center for Free Expression's virtual forum series. The topic for today's discussion is the smart city in the digital world. How can issues of democratic governance, privacy, and surveillance be addressed? For today's uh, discussion, I'd like to go over a few things about the format of it. Um, you will be able to see each of the panelists and the moderator as I introduce them. Uh, after about 45 minutes of their discussion, uh, we'll turn to the audience uh, to, for questions and answers. Um, and to be able to ask questions, please look down at the bottom of your screen. There's a question and answer button. And uh, you click on that and you can write at any time during the uh, uh, conversation, any questions that come to mind, write them as, as we go along. Uh, all the questions will be visible to you, all the your questions will be visible to you, but to nobody else except for Ange Holmes, the center's coordinator. And when we get to the question and answer session of the uh, event, the um, uh, Ange will ask, uh, will relay the questions to the panel so that they can answer them for you. Uh, please note that the chat uh, a button at the bottom of your screen is disabled for this uh, uh, Zoom conference call or conference discussion. When we get to the question and answer uh, part, uh, as I said, Ange will, it will read the first of the questions to the panel. Uh, they will answer and then she'll go to the next question and, and for as much as we have time. Uh, this whole uh, conversation and question and answer session will be recorded. And a video recording will be posted on the podcast section of the Center for Free Expression's website. It will also be under the events section. And our website address is CFE, Center for Free Expression. So CFE.Ryerson.ca. Um, I would like to uh, thank Ange, who I've mentioned, who's the center's coordinator and who really does most of the work to make these uh, panel discussions possible. And I'd also like to thank Brian Bowes and Luke Nader from Ryerson's uh, Media Services, whose technical expertise has been and continues to be invaluable. Finally, I want to mention our third panel, which will be at the same time next Wednesday, uh, May 20th, is entitled, Who is, to free, Who is Free to Speak of Genocide? Perspectives on Reclaiming Power and Place the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Now to our panel uh, for today. It's quite a distinguished panel, and I'm really pleased to be able to uh, present each of them to you. First, I'd like to introduce Nabil Ahmed. Nabil is a program officer at Open North, part of the one-to-one -one advisory service that is sharing knowledge, expertise, and guidance on open cities to communities across Canada. Uh, Nabil has a background in social entrepreneurship, community engagement, social innovation, and international development. Nabil earned his Master in Environmental Studies degree at uh, York University, where his research focused on big data and urban planning. He previously studied public policy at Ryerson University and business administration at the uh, Institute of Business Administration in Karachi, Pakistan. Nabil currently serves on the board of the Telcel Institute and was selected as an Aga Khan Foundation Canada Fellow in 2013-14. Welcome, Nabil. Our second panelist is Tracy Lorio. Tracy is an assistant professor of critical media and big data in the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University and is cross-appointed to the MA in Digital Humanities and the Institute for Data Science, also at Carleton. She is actively engaged in public policy research as it pertains to uh, data and smart cities and their related infrastructures. Tracy is a member of the Multi-Stakeholder Forum on Open Government uh, of the Treasury Board Secretariat of Canada, and is also a research associate of the Center of Technology and Law, Pol Law and Policy at Ottawa University, of the Institut uh, National de la Recherche Scientifique at, in Montreal, of the Geno uh, Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center at Carleton University and of the Maynooth uh, University uh, Social Science Institute. Welcome, uh, Tracy. Our third panelist is Vincent Mosco. 
Uh, Vincent is a professor emeritus of sociology at Queen's University, where he held the Canada Research Chair in Communications and Society. He is also a distinguished professor of communications, the New Media Center in Fudan University in Shanghai. Vincent is author or editor of 26 books, including The Digital, Digital Sublime and The Political Economy of Communication. Originally, this panel was going to be held live in Toronto and was going to be the occasion for the launch of uh, Vincent's most recent book, which has the same title as this panel, The Smart City in a Digital World. Uh, because we're um, doing this uh, by Zoom, uh, the best we can do at, to make it a book launch is to show you the image of this book um, and where you can order it should you uh, wish to uh, uh, be able to get it. Um, um, I'd encourage you to get it from an independent bookseller. We're trying to keep them in business. And if not, uh, try Chapters uh, Indigo. And I guess last resort is, is uh, uh, Amazon. Uh, they all have it available. It's a wonderful book uh, that I'd recommend strongly. And I think you'll be interested, especially after hearing Vincent today. Among Vincent's many awards and honors, he was named co-recipient of the 2019 C. Edwin Baker Award for Outstanding Scholarship in Media, Markets, and Democracy by the International Communications Association. Uh, Vincent received his MA from Georgetown University, his PhD in sociology from Harvard. And finally, moderating this ding distinguished panel is an equally, equally distinguished uh, individual, and that's Andrew Clement. Andrew is a professor emeritus in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, where he coordinates the Information Policy Research Program and co-founded the Identity, Privacy, and Security Institute. With a PhD in computer science, Andrew has had longstanding research and teaching interests in the social implications of information and communication technologies and participatory design. Among his recent privacy and surveillance research projects are uh, the Snowden Archives, which is an online searchable collection of all the documents that Edward Snowden released and have been published uh, by news media. Uh, second is Seeing Through the Cloud, which examined extranational outsourcing of e-communication services, especially by universities. A third is IXMAPS, I-X-M-A-P-S dot C-A, which is an internet mapping tool, a fascinating one, that helps uh, make visible NSA warrantless wiretapping activities. It also shows the routing of Canadian personal data through the United States, even when the uh, origin of it may be from your computer to a colleague's computer across the hall. And finally, surveillancerights.ca, uh, which documents non-compliance of video surveillance installations with privacy regulations and helps citizens understand their related privacy rights. Um, Andrew, on top of all this, and directly relevant to the topic today, is a member of Waterfront Toronto's Dig Digital Strategy Advisory Panel. So I'd like to welcome all of you. I'm grateful for you all being here and I'd like to turn it now over to Andrew and the panel. Thank you. Uh, Jim, and uh, thank you all there, uh, all of you out there uh, for joining us um, in what I hope will be a, a stimulating conversation about um, a very pertinent topic. Um, Canadians and Torontonians um, in particular have been hearing a lot about the promise and perils of smart cities um, over the last couple of years. Uh, news about urban futures has been dominated by debates over the ambitious plans that Sidewalk Labs, a Google affiliate, um, has been developing to create an entire neighborhood um, in the heart of Toronto, quote, from the internet up. Uh, the waterfront uh, uh, Keyside neighborhood with its tall timber construction, building raincoats, reconfigurable pav pavement, and at its core, a ubiquitous sensor network uh, producing torrents of data that would feed into algorithmic systems controlling street lights, waste sorting, water recycling, building access, and on and on. Um, Keyside was to be a shiny example of how the visions of one of the world's most successful tech companies could parlay its digital mastery into making cities more efficient, sustainable, affordable, economically vibrant, and more livable uh, generally. But that dream burst last week when abruptly Sidewalk Labs pulled out, citing economic uncertainty related to the COVID crisis. Some will be tempted to sigh with relief or disappointment and get back to business as usual. 
But there are also those, and uh, many of you who are watching, I hope, who see this as a moment of opportunity to advance a richer and more inclusive vision of what cities can be like in the future, cities that draw intelligently on the capabilities of, te of digital technologies, but are not enchanted by them. I think the most positive legacy of the Sidewalk Labs uh, project may be that it has put onto the public agenda many of the critical issues that are that come with with introducing digital technologies, but are usually invisible uh, because they're slipped in um, unobtrusively. Uh, you know, s smart metering here, um, uh, traffic lights there. These sorts of things that are that are actually ongoing, as we'll hear from our, our panel, there is a long history to um, smart city developments and the incorporation of digital technologies um, that is going on steadily. So the issues around smart cities and the ideas of, of smart cities, the visions and the imaginaries, are not going to go any uh, away anytime soon. So it is a it's still a live and very pertinent topic. I can think of no better way of, of getting into that uh, topic of, of smart cities than um, the book that was just mentioned uh, by, by Vinny Moscow. It's a wonderful book, uh, The Smart City in the Digital Age. Um, and so I'd like to begin this conversation by, by um, drawing in uh, Vinny here. Um, in your book, Vinny, uh, you highlight the role of that smart city development can play in addressing the global crisis of climate change. Um, that was the crisis um, last year. Um, and uh, you, you talk about uh, repeatedly, if, if it's done well, it could really help. But now suddenly the world's attention has shifted to the COVID crisis. Uh, can you lay out for us what you mean by smart cities and why it is fruitful for us to be discussing this topic, even especially under the current circumstances? So, Vinny, over to you. Sure. Uh, thanks, Andrew. And, and let me say it's, it's great to be part of this uh, panel. And, and thank you all out there for zooming in. Um, the standard definition of a smart city is, is one that makes extensive use of digital technologies. Sensors embedded everywhere, data stored and processed in the cloud, uh, advanced wireless systems tying everything together, the most recent being 5G and big data analysis uh, used to develop decision-making algorithms. These are used to manage transportation, energy use, communication systems, and of course, people. Ostensibly, uh, this is gonna help make all of our lives better. Uh, but in fact, our experience to date demonstrates that smart cities primarily benefited big tech companies that make the hardware, sell the software, as well as the mythologies to uh, big cities around the world. Um, and um, they also assist governments, uh, particularly authoritarian ones. Uh, China has been the leading developer of smart cities around the world. Just about half of all smart cities are located there. Now, because of the problems associated with this approach, uh, including deepening surveillance, and as you alluded to, uh, the threat of these technologies to the environment, my book offers an alternative. I argue that it's people who make smart cities uh, smart. And as that uh, great New Yorker and Torontonian Jane Jacobs taught us years ago, are the smartest cities draw from the practical knowledge of people who live and work in cities. Technology can help, but only if it's developed in a democratic and egalitarian setting that respects the rights of citizens to control their own communities and, just as important, their own data. Now, the COVID crisis makes the discussion of smart cities even more important because it's raising questions that go to the heart of debates over smart cities. So we hear calls for more surveillance, such as through technology-based uh, contact tracing. But I should also say that it's heartening to observe the opportunities that the crisis is uh, enabling, including opening debates about the need for more public space, from wider sidewalks to more park space, and for greater restrictions on automobiles. 
I'm encouraged as well by the growth of mutual aid and grassroots movements that have sprung up in communities around the world to help one another deal with the global pandemic. Now, as you noted, I wrote the book to alert people to the connection between smart cities and climate change, specifically how smart city tech can either deepen or ameliorate climate problems. COVID makes this challenge all the more salient. So in conclusion, pandemics and climate change are intimately connected and how cities respond to each uh, will I think go a long way to shaping our future. Right, well, thank you, Vinny. Um, Tracy, uh, as a scholar and an activist, you've long attended to the burgeoning incorporation of digital technologies into city, mm -hmm. into cities and urban life. In particular, you've helped develop the idea of an open smart city as distinct from the more conventional meanings, uh, perhaps even as an antidote to the way in which smart cities have been conceptualized. Uh, could you explain what you, you mean by these two terms and what the distinction is that's important for us here in Canada? So when in the having been involved with open data, open government, open science, open standards, open specifications, and spatial data infrastructures over time, I came to be concerned with the idea that uh, we might repeat some earlier mistakes. And some of the earlier mistakes are that we will deploy technologies. Um, they will not be governed well. They will not be open and interoperable. And they will not be driven by the wants and needs and aspirations and evidence-based research of the institutions, the civil society organizations, and the people who are interested in these technologies and being deployed. But also that these new technologies when it comes to cities are actually intricately intertwined with the city's infrastructure. And in a way, part of the master plan or part of a transportation master plan and so on, but they're not deliberated in that way. And they're often not incorporated as part of that master plan or as part of the transportation master plan and so on. Um, and that, drove me to take a step back with, with some friends at Open North and say, okay, well, how can we look at network urbanism, which was the definition that uh, uh, Vinny introduced for us at the beginning of this talk. And then how do we ensure that we don't have that version of a smart city that is you know, proprietary and closed and, and primarily serving the interests of big companies? How can we develop uh, an open smart city that keeps the principles of openness and open architecture and open infrastructure and so on, but that enables uh, participation and engagement and fairness and accountability and all those good things to be a part of that decision making. But also, how do we create an, uh, a guide, if you will, that can be useful for decision makers inside government? And so, you know, if, if I took the usual scholarly route, the chances of you know, a public servant or a chief technology officer or information officer or the chance of an administrator in the IT subcommittee of a city to read it is about zero. And so what we did is we decided to develop a guide and a definition that uses the language of roadmaps and guides and uh, tools and instruments and program and planning that a city planner might use or a chief technology officer might use in a language that's accessible to them as a kind of decision making tree so that when they are going to go make decisions about the deployment of large technologies, whether or not the intentions are good, that decisions get made so that the technologies are not, don't turn into surveillance technologies or that we maybe procure from Canadian companies as we're hearing now, maybe that's not a bad idea. That maybe we think of smaller companies, maybe we develop and deliberate the specifications and where we want those technologies to be deployed with citizens and with community-based organizations. And then how would you actually go about doing that kind of work? And so we scoured the world to take a look at really great examples of where this was happening. So for example, you know, if we talk about climate change and human rights, which, which Vinny quite rightly brought up and has carefully been considering for decades, you know, how, how can we procure sensors that are not made from slave labor, for instance? 
right? It's possible to do that. How can we procure um, these same devices that come from good manufacturing, but also with longevity, so that the millions of devices that we might put in the environment are not actually going to harm the environment because they have a short shelf life and they're not very good. And then how do we ensure that these are not used as an instrument of distributed ubiquitous types of surveillance? And how do we think of governing those things? So in a way, the guide was developed with that in mind. And I look forward to talking a bit more about it throughout, throughout our, our seminar here. But the idea was really to develop a guide that was accessible and usable for people in the public service who are the ones who are going to make decisions about these and for the governors and the administrators and the chief technology officers to go, yes, we make technology decisions, but this infrastructure is now part of the urban plan and we ought to have discussions about these technologies in an educated way. Right, well, very interesting. Um, Nabil, you, you're at um, Open North, uh, mentioned a couple of times now, um, and you've been watching the Smart Cities uh, Challenge that um, mm -hmm. in which uh, over 200 communities across Canada have responded to infrastructure's, uh, Canada's call for smart city proposals. Um, last year, there were five winners uh, with uh, getting a, a total of 75 million in what has the smart cities approach meant in this context? And uh, in particular, um, how have the core issues around uh, governance, as we've just basically uh, barely touched on yet, um, been addressed in Infrastructure Canada's uh, proposal and by the applicants and how they've responded? Thanks, Andrew. Um, and I'm gonna build on uh, what Vincent and uh, Tracy just said in my response, but I think, uh, to just jump off exactly what Tracy was saying, one of the unique things about the Smart City Challenge is that it really shifted from being techno-solutionist to centering the problems. It's, mm -hmm. it's not uh, a series of solutions looking for problems. They created a way and a platform for citizens and cities to identify problems and then think about the solutions. Uh, so it's really shifting you know, uh, the focus uh, to what, city, what citizens need and what urban challenges are actually being faced. So in the challenge, they, for, you know, they identified broad outcome areas. They asked every community that was participating to identify a challenge statement to really define their problem. And that was the first part. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and had to align to like outcome areas such as empowerment and inclusion, environmental quality, safety and security. So, you know, broad buckets that really met citizen needs instead of saying, you know, how can we use smart lampposts or how can we use, you know, uh, a camera surveillance system to better solve our mobility challenges. They started with the problems first. And I think that's the most important thing. The other thing that was uh, really critical is that um, in the application, uh, they mandated um, community engagement. So uh, every community that took part in the challenge had to demonstrate in their application how they had engaged with citizens, how they had ensured that many citizens were engaged, not just a small proportion of citizens, which often tends to happen, and how they would continue that engagement beyond uh, the time period of the application, right? So, uh, and that, I think that's really significant because it uh, kind of really forced uh, communities to like have the broad public conversation that, you know, uh, both Vincent and Tracy have mentioned is so essential for smart cities. Um, and, and what this meant was that, you know, communities that had strong civic uh, participation initiatives and civic tech initiatives were able to do better uh, but it also really mobilized, you know, a whole round of consultation around smart city issues. Um, mm -hmm. and I think uh, the conversation that we've seen around Sidewalk Labs, Block Sidewalk, has also kind of really uh, been really timely. In a way, it's kind of helped, uh, you know, make the case for why we need to have broad public conversations about public spaces um, and the use of public technology. Uh, you know, as, as Vinny said, you know, like, Authoritarian governments have been very interested in uh, smart cities, but it's important to recognize that there's a long history and enduring reality of communities that are discriminated against and exploited in the name of like using data and technology. And again, this the format that the Smart City Challenge used uh, allow you know tried to address that in a subtle way by ensuring that you know a broad um, swath of stakeholders was engaged. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of you know what I'll highlight and how and some other issues in terms of like governance that were uh, mentioned certainly you know there was I think a focus on ensuring that certain values were uh, embedded such as openness 
privacy was an important part of uh, the mm -hmm. challenge. Uh, in fact, for all the 20 finalists, they had to submit their applications to their provincial or local privacy commissioners uh, and had to go through a privacy impact assessment. So that ensured that you know privacy was not an afterthought, but it was actually embedded in the process of the challenge itself, which is uh, significant. Um, and uh, you know, also ensured that you know you were building capacity in the government to actually work on these uh, on these issues. Um, you know, not just ensuring that we're talking about it and that you know this is left to like a small uh, group of consultants that are driving the process, but rather that you know this is actually uh, building municipal capacity. Uh, and and you know, Vincent has spoken about in his book. He speaks about municipalism and the idea that you know we're going to uh, push back and reassert local agency and authority. Uh, and I think the challenge has provided some of the tools for that. Well, that's great. We've, uh, thank you all. I mean, we've, we've put a lot of uh, rich material on the, on the table here. I was wondering if you, this is a conversation, so um, you may want to say something to each other and respond to what's being said. So, well, you know, I, I think it's time, uh, an appropriate time to applaud uh, the citizens of Toronto and the social movements around it for their success mm -hmm. in ending a very dangerous experiment as Google through sidewalks, sidewalk labs tried to build a model of the surveillance city. And uh, by organizing, participating actively, uh, groups like uh, uh, Block Sidewalk, Acorn, uh, my colleagues here, uh, and uh, or organized, demonstrated, and stopped this project, opening an opportunity that I'm sure Tracy and Nabil can talk about, uh, that uh, for building a genuinely democratic uh, smart city, starting with the Keyside uh, neighborhood. I think there's there might be something in the Canadian soup, so to speak. Right. So if, you, if we think of Infrastructure Canada Smart City Challenge was launched before we knew about sidewalk mm -hmm. with already really good principles embedded in it. And not only embedding really good principles in the process, but also sharing the outcomes publicly. Right. So we can get access to the 200 submissions, the 20 shortlisted and the five winners or the four winners. And we can get access to the dreams, aspirations, and challenges and problems that are being experienced by cities and communities across this country, which is also really, really interesting. And, and I know that my students and I, we spend a lot of time going back through those submissions, learning from them. But then the Open Smart City Project that was funded by Natural Resources Canada comes out of their long work of spatial data infrastructures. And Canada was one of the best in terms of spatial data infrastructures back to, you know, open and interoperable and issues based on all those kinds of things. And then as Nabil said, you know, so it comes out of that, that was already there. And then we already had a really well established, you know, open data annual summit and local regional open data, open government meetings, uh, conversations, uh, the, the multi-stakeholder advisory group to open government, and then really good science and people acting as what, I, you know, what Andrew Feenberg would call technological citizens, where we get involved, we bring our expertise to the table, no matter where we are in the rank and file or what we do in our lives, we respect each other's opinions and we bring it to the table to negotiate and discuss. And I think that's a part of what was happening in Toronto and I think what was happening across the country with regards to thinking about things. And I think the work that you've been up to, Nabil, at Open North has also been really interesting in thinking of like, is there something going on in Canada that might be different, that might be in, in, informing an, another conversation in this space that's saying, you know, we're not quite ready for these big infrastructural projects unless they're going to be on our terms. And, uh, and I find that really, really interesting. I don't know what, what you think, but I think there's something really interesting that I haven't seen in other places about this aspect of openness and this really intelligent conversation about technology and data that we're seeing with contact tracing as well. Go ahead, Namil. Yeah, uh, it's... Uh... You know, there was uh, Bianca Wiley, who's one of the leaders of the Block Sidewalk Movement, has mm -hmm. talked about kind of messy governance. And, you know, we talk about, you know, bureaucracy being slow is a bad thing, but in a way, 
this is exactly why sometimes it takes a mm -hmm. long time for government to make decisions because we need to think through the implications of the decisions that we make. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, uh, Canada has benefited from. I think that, you know, we have a culture of public service uh, where there's a duty of care afforded to, you know, the infrastructure that is being developed. And I think, um, you know, what the block sidewalk movement uh, and activists and, and, you know, the other work of academics uh, have been able to achieve is ensure that, you know, they're considering the implications um, of, you know, installing surveillance technologies, for instance. And, and thinking not just like, how do we do this better to like, do we even need to do this? So shifting from, you know, how can we better track and surveil groups to saying like, do we even need to collect this data? Is it really helpful? Is it helping us solve the issue? Uh, I think that's the conversation that, you know, again, um, uh, has been really uh, valuable. And I, I want to actually also flag, Canada also has a very vibrant civic tech community. Uh, mm -hmm. In you know communities across Canada, we have groups of people who meet on a regular basis and try to think about using data technology. And I think they have uh, been a really um, key source of kind of uh, they because uh, of of uh, thoughtful advice because they are technical experts as well as being really engaged in civic issues. Uh, you know they're not bringing uh, you know an engineer's mindset where the only issue is to problem solve the problem, but they're actually thinking about how to engage with the community. Uh, and I think uh, you know groups like Code for Canada, mm -hmm. you know, and many of the and and all the civic tech groups across the country have been uh, really uh, instrumental. I think in this. Yeah, I think I think that's. Oh, uh, go ahead, Benny, and I'll jump in. No one appreciates the Canadian soup more than I do. Um, <laughs> Years ago, I chose, right. You're from the US. <laughs> I chose to live in this country. I'm, I'm a, a, an American by birth, uh, so no one's happier uh, to be here than I am. At the same time, I think it's important to recognize that some of the ideas that you and Tracy and Nabil are talking about are now have now spread globally. Um, after all, it was um, New Yorkers, I'm proud to say, who drove Amazon out of its planned uh, uh, headquarters in New York City uh, because Amazon simply demanded uh, outrageous benefits and wouldn't comply with uh, fundamental needs to consult with the people who are going to uh, work at the company. Um, and it's also important, as you both know, I think that uh, we need to point to global models. Uh, and, and I would certainly turn and have turned my attention in my book to Barcelona as a model of the uh, citizen-driven smart city. Uh, without eschewing technology, Barcelona makes a lot of use uh, of technology, but it does so democratically after mass consultations uh, with citizens and a lot of trial and error and uh, a lot of consultation and ultimately transparency. So I think what we have here, and, and Canada has been a model, but uh, a model uh, that is shared by models uh, around the world for both how to resist uh, some of the more top-down smart city approaches and how to build democratic alternatives. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, this is uh, you know, it's very interesting. Um, the, your, the point that uh, uh, Tracy and uh, Nabil, you both um, drew on uh, in terms of the infrastructure, um, propo infrastructure Canada's proposals of emphasizing identification of problems and of sharing those before moving on to questions of, you know, what's the right solution um, is a direct inverse of what we observed in the um, Sidewalk Labs um, uh, proposals, um, which use the word solution throughout um, uh, quite egregiously in, in, in my view. And um, uh, it's been called uh, te solutionism, technological solutionism, which is rampant in, from Silicon Valley. Um, so that's very re refreshing. Um, on the other hand, um, I would say that there were so many good ideas in Sidewalk Labs uh, proposals that we, I don't think we should throw the, all of the baby out with the bathwater. Um, but, and one of the ones that uh, intersects with what um, 
we've been talking about is this idea of openness. Um, Sidewalk Labs promised that all of the data that they would they were collect they would collect would be made open after it had been de-identified. And, and leaving aside for, for the moment the question of whether de-identification is an adequate uh, way of of sort of cleansing data of uh, personal interest and and just making it available as a public resource, um, I think there's some serious questions as to whether that's actually even if it could be done is a good idea. Should all of the data that comes out of um, the, you know, sensors, you know, think of cameras, right? Um, be made publicly available for any use in an unregulated way, what, you know, go wild, uh, make money or serve your neighbors or, or whatever. Um, so, so I'm gonna push back a little bit on the idea of openness and and ask for a little bit of a more nuanced treatment of um, of openness um, so that it's it's just not an unalloyed good because that often I think per, pervades the sort of the counter argument to closed and proprietary so do you want to respond to that maybe I'll take a bit of a shot at this um, and I think I think you're also touching on this is a conversation that the kind of open advocacy community has been having for the last a few years uh, thinking about you know the limits of openness and like you know thinking about and recognizing that you know this idea that we had that you know opening up everything and you know being more transparent would necessarily in and of, in and of itself be good that is that can be true if what you're trying to do is hold government to account but maybe if you're you know uh, risking the privacy of others it's not so good and I think this also uh, I you know links that Data is political. So if all the data is open, then you're you're risking uh, transferring political agency and power to others who might who might not have the rights uh, or or might not be able to use that uh, in the right way. Uh, the example I'll share is let's say you know uh, this is entirely off the top of my head now, but <laughs> but thinking about you know how transit data is used or location data, right? Mm -hmm. If we consider all that data to be open then potentially uh, private corporations could be using that in ways that privilege their interests at the expense of the interests of citizens. Uh, and that's something that in fact we've already seen. Uh, so should that data be open or not? I think that's a question. And even within government, there are instances where data should sometimes be closed um, and should not always be open to all stakeholders at all, at all times. Um, and Tracy, I'm seeing you're nodding, so maybe you want to add to that. So, so when we say open, of course, we think of open with contingencies. It doesn't mean open the door to everything. It means where warranted, where required, and where useful, and where it makes sense, and it doesn't infringe on other people's rights. The data ought to be open. And if any of those considerations are an issue, then issues of how they should be open. How should the data be aggregated? How should they be shared? Who they, should they be shared with? What are the governing models? And like all good governing models, same thing with you know, open science or, or archives or with the spatial data infrastructure, these things are negotiated. And so to bring back what Vinny was talking about, this has to be a public type of discussion. It doesn't mean open the doors to everything. It means open under certain contingencies. I think one of my favorite examples is in the city of Ottawa here, we have a traffic management control and communication center. Um, their cam they have a very specific mandate, traffic control, not surveillance. So their cameras can never zoom in on the license plate. They do no license plate recognition, for instance, because it is not part of their mandate to do license plate recognition. The way they aim their cameras, for instance, in the context of the city of Ottawa, is at the intersection but, and, and when the traffic is coming, but not specifically at individual cars or at drivers, for example. They keep their data for 30 days. And if the police want access to those data, they have to ask for it within that 30 day period. And they only get a subset of the data where there's an incident that has occurred. If they've passed that 30 day timeline, too bad, the data are gone. And if it's something beyond an incident, like a traffic accident and so on, they can't go on a fishing expedition to get access to those data. So the data are open. I can watch the webcams if I want, right? We can go and watch all of these webcams, but at the end of the day, they don't publish all of the data of all of the intersections because it does, actually doesn't serve the purpose and the mandate of traffic management. 
And so openness is always, you know, contingent on the institutions, the practices, the standards, the context, and the mission and the mandate of the organizations that are involved. But when I talk about open science, I'm really talking about the practice of having good quality, interoperable, valid, reliable scientific models that govern the collection of data. And when we get into smart cities, and, and, and Vinny might have some examples of that, when we get into smart cities, because it's primarily corporate driven, it's as if all the science is gone. Like there's ridiculous air quality sensors that are being released and models that don't make sense. Um, there's different temperature sensors that don't make sense. Even some of the, you know, well, let's use Strava to assess cycling in the city. Well, we know that, you know, the super road warrior fellas in their high speed bikes are the ones who are weighing Strava. And me, who was like going on my bike with my bike buggy going to daycare, didn't wear Strava, which meant that the, the solutions that would have been informed by Strava would have been very male and a particular kind of an athletic form of cycling, not that I'm not a little bit of an athlete, but maybe not like those fellas, and uh, which meant that we would have missed the multiple trips that other people in the city make when they're cycling, for instance. And so considering gender issues, considering those types of issues also need to be taken into consideration so that we can address the bias issues as well. So it's not about opening everything, it's about opening some things, and it's about really thinking about the specificities of different you know, assemblages of contexts, but also thinking of bias and other issues that might come into play with how we use those data and deploy those data. Yeah, another, very good. The, the, another issue uh, that came up with a sidewalk, uh, you know, making, offering this everything open uh, as to drawing on this language of openness is of course, who has the actual capability to exploit that and um, the so one of the arguments about that was uh, that it would exaggerate existing um, you know information and power asymmetries by this move of of openness. Um, Vinny, do you want to add um, to that yeah, before I mean, we we open up for for questions? So if you have questions out there, um, you know, send them in. Yeah, um, just a brief point on this. Again, I'd like to zoom out from Canada. Um, because people might wonder, you know, what's, what's the big deal about this? And, and um, while we might uh, debate, given that we have participatory structures in Canada, it's not the case in other places. So uh, in, in, in a place like Rio de Janeiro, uh, where um, IBM moved in to create an operations center, what you've got there are the equivalent of war rooms that monitor a mass surveilled city uh, where uh, dozens of people sit in this war room in their white jumpsuits observing on the screen maps that can monitor every moving vehicle in the city and focus on where uh, the government perceives there to be problems, whether it's homeless uh, people or, or people uh, protesting as they did uh, the uh, World Cup and the Olympic Games there. It's the same in Singapore where Siemens moved in to create its own operation center and war room uh, where street lights are used as surveillance uh, vehicles and instruments. Um, there, uh, open data uh, is, is a vital issue uh, of life and death for many people. And so it's important for us to understand that while we can focus debate uh, democratically in a place like Canada, it's much more uh, difficult, more challenging, and more lucrative for the big tech companies who are operating in, in places uh, like Rio or Singapore or in Wuhan or Shanghai. Um, and uh, I think it's it's, essential to see this as a global issue. And I think, uh, yeah, and I think the other thing in the context of Canada, the conversation is uneven and sure. practicing these deliberations is uneven. What happens, you know, and we saw that unevenness even in the Infrastructure Canada submissions, the, the different quality and the abilities across the country and different cities are deliberating and not all cities are deliberating in the same way. And just like how we forgot to wash our hands somehow in our popular culture and in our knowledge. We are forgetting some of the fundamental principles of accountability, transparency, 
fairness, trust, uh, public engagement, equality, equity in the deliberations that we have as well. So it's not to say that, you know, certainly not to say that to paint the picture of, oh, Canada, we're so wonderful, which tends to be, you know, a leaning that many, many people here have, but there are some things that are interesting and that the reason that Open North and Nabil and many others are involved in this work on an ongoing basis is precisely because it is an uneven conversation and we're gonna have to continue having these conversations all the time so that we can at least all get on an even playing field at some point. Okay, great, well, we we could talk about this for uh, endlessly, I think, <laughs> very richly, um, but, um, but I bet people have some questions for us. So, um, Ange, uh, could you um, uh, let us have the first one? And, and if you are struggling to um, ask a question, there's uh, the reminder about the button at the bottom, a and a Q&A, and um, we'd look forward to hearing what you have to, to ask us. So go ahead, Ange. Hi. Uh, yeah, so the question uh, is from an attendee, and they say, is it possible for, is it possible that Sidewalk Labs left because the crop of new Big Brother contact tracing apps will replace the data harvesting that would have been realized by their implementation in a controlled space. Well, I mean, I, I, I would say Vinny, go ahead. briefly that was, I mean, there was a concern. I mean, after all, Eric Schmidt, uh, the, the chair of uh, Alphabet, the uh, parent company of Google and Sidewalk Labs, was in the office of uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo just recently uh, heading a committee to determine the direction of New York State uh, in a post-COVID world, making as extensive use of technology as, as possible. So it is the case that big tech sees big money in a post-COVID world. Uh, that's very important. At the same time, it's important not to lose sight of uh, the resistance that uh, Sidewalk Labs, Google, faced uh, in Toronto. Eric Schmidt really wanted Toronto. He, after all, years ago said, give me a city and put us in charge. And crazily, the government of Canada for a time did that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, I think, very important not to underestimate uh, the resistance that essentially taught Google that the terms of dealing with uh, uh, the Canadian people were going to be much too uh, difficult and far less lucrative uh, than Google uh, anticipated initially. But also, you know, contact tracing is very specific, mm -hmm. right? It's, a, it's yeah. a Bluetooth, a Bluetooth, a phone to a phone related to a model that's related to epidemiology, GPS, GSM, et cetera. It's a very, very narrow it's very significant and we need to consider it carefully and cautiously and, and debate it and so on. But it's very, very narrow. Whereas when you're talking about, you know, the first North American ground up smart city, which was, you know, the ultimate dream for, you know, Sidewalk Toronto and the Keyside Project, we're talking heating systems. We're talking sensors in buildings. We're talking water consumption. We're talking uh, movement of cars and vehicles and swiping things using the laundromat, for example, whatever, right? Things that happen and debates about public and private and semi-private space, as well as aggregate types of privacy. So those are the kinds of issues like Vincent brought up that people were pushing back against. So, you know, contact tracing, yes, it's a kind of Trojan horse in a way to sensitize the public to, oh, to, to willingly forego their data for a greater public good, even though the technology is kind of shoddy and it doesn't really work and we're not going to have the uptake and so on. Putting those conversations aside, people, you know, kind of go, oh, sure, we'll do that because it might be better for us in the long run. So that's a, 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 a tricky conversation and we're seeing how it might play out. We're also seeing counter arguments to contact tracing, in addition to the great counter arguments that we saw with regards to smart cities in Toronto, but even the province of Quebec, for instance, they put out a fantastic report by their ethics committee, Is la ville intelligente dans l'intérêt public? So their ethics committee already had a report on ethical guidelines and practices of public interest governing in, a, in the context of a smart city. So there are some really good conversations to be had that are driving these things, but the wedge of contact tracing is very small, I think, in, in this conversation. Good. Well, I see that there are 
questions are piling in. So um, Angie, let's hear another one. Uh, yeah, so I have another question uh, from Dexter. And Dexter asked, do you have faith in the Trudeau and Ford government's backing publicly owned controlled smart city projects, especially if those don't maximize profits? Not a leading question at all. <laughs> uh, okay, Nabil, I think. Not yours, the... Nabil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would not dare to comment on, on, uh, on the political kind of um, yeah. governments, but I, what I would say is that I think I have faith in public servants who are committed to, uh, you know, ensuring that, you know, they are addressing the issues that citizens face, that they, that I have faith that, you know, the, because at the end of the day, these systems, they are, they're not um, limited to the timeline of a specific or the lifetime of a specific government. Uh, these are long drawn conversations. And in fact, it's a good thing that, you know, it's going to take us you know, several years to think about these things and to lay the infrastructure uh, because um, that's how we will ensure that, you know, we're able to, um, you know, as the question asks, uh, you know, uh, kind of, you know, um, think about public control and pu public ownership. Um, and I think uh, there, that is, you know, where citizens have an opportunity. And I think that's part of the responsibility that civil society has to ensure that we're building digital literacy, we're you know ensuring that this conversation is a public conversation, ensuring that you know uh, we're talking about consent, talking about you know talking in easily understandable, inclusive language. I think there's a responsibility that we have. Uh, I, I don't. This is me speaking personally now, but I don't. I don't think that our attitude should be to necessarily just point fingers at the government and blame them for the future. I think that you know the future is what we make it, uh, and we can make it something that is not. Some of, uh, one that maximizes only profit. Um, well, I, you know, I agree, but if you allow me, I will point a finger. Um, helps to be a retired academic. Um, <laughs> after all, it was the prime minister, uh, the premier of Ontario, then Kathleen Wynne. So it was Prime Minister Trudeau, Kathleen Wynne, and John Tory, who were there at the announcement uh, when Google uh, said it was coming to Toronto. And they wholeheartedly supported it without knowing anything about what Google planned to do. That's because Google didn't tell us what it planned to do. I'm hoping that politicians like our prime minister have learned their lesson from uh, Keyside, that they will in future consult more broadly, uh, question the promoters of smart city solutions in much more and much more rigorously than they did this time. Uh, at the same time, we can't assume they will and we have to keep the pressure on yes. to resist uh, their tendency to succumb to the mythologies of big tech and to continue to offer them the kinds of alternatives that you, Nabil, and Tracy have put on the table to the, the plans of, of big tech companies. And I, and I think, you know, in, um, we have to also think of the divisions of power in Canada. Cities come under the guise of the provinces, and there's different politicians that lead different provinces in different ways and, and different types of citizens' actions in different parts across the country. We can also say that, you know, Trudeau also signed off on the Infrastructure Canada project, which was really quite interesting and not about big tech. So we have multiple models of how we look at and, in, and it's just even in the context of, you know, what you're saying, Nabil, with administrators, if we think of the smart grid for the province of Ontario and the local distribution centers, you know, there was a conversation at one point about the third party resale of the data that were, go that were derived and produced in the smart grid that manages the electrical system in the province of Ontario and the board the OEM board came pushed back and said actually you know what we're not going to sell those data to third parties yes we will share some of those data with analysts across the country and engineers so that we can improve the grid we can start thinking of sustainability we can start changing consumption discussions if we start thinking of climate change um, and to manage those things but no we're not going to resell those data 
So that's, you know, also happened under Ford. So I'm, yeah, I agree, uh, Vincent, that, that yes, that, you know, politicians get involved, they sign whatever, right? Like whatever people bring up to them. So I'm, I'm loath to say the Trudeau government or the Ford government, but I will say that we screw up, right? And that we all screw up. You know, if we think of ourselves as citizens and residents, how many of us sit at uh, technology uh, committee meetings in our cities? How many of us are well versed on these conversations? The thing is, it brings up the, what you brought up also, Andrew, the, the topic of, you know, the kind of the digital divide or the knowledge divide. There is also a sense that within cities, you know, that the technology subcommittee has a lot more power than the housing and homelessness committee or the daycare committee or even the planning committee because they don't necessarily work together in a transdisciplinary way. And I think the, the work that Open North is doing with their community uh, project to start like bringing together these different branches of government to have these different kinds of conversations, almost like the, the divide in academia between the social scientists and engineering, right? And how we need to bring those, or, or what we're seeing right now, the MDs versus social determinants of health and public health practitioners and how they didn't meet and we screwed up during the pandemic. Um, we missed elder care. But it's this idea of bringing these multidisciplinary groups in that is also really, really handy and really important in these considerations. So it's like outside of government, we need to be involved. And then inside of government, we need to make sure that people have the information they need to make these good decisions. Okay, thank you. We, we have uh, several uh, good questions, I see. So Angie, um, next. Uh, yes, the next one is from Nick, and Nick uh, says, smart type technologies are being included in building projects throughout Toronto without consultation. Mm -hmm. Also, what digital policy there is remains very general and open to abuse. So Nick would like to understand better why the speakers were saying that digital discussions are more advanced in Canada when it doesn't always appear to be so. It's, they're uneven. It's uneven. Right, so for example, I have a student, uh, Olivia Faria, her work is on smart buildings as spaces for spousal abuse and how your smart house can actually be used to abuse you, to gaslight you or people who work in your home or the childcare workers and so on. And that's an actual issue. And you know, the real estate agencies are not having a conversation about that issue. Uh, the police don't know how to have a conversation about domestic disputes and technology and smart homes. So it's, it's, yes, we are good in something. I think it's, I think the universal of everything's great is wrong and everything is terrible is wrong. It is uneven, right? And so suddenly real estate agents are promoting, hey, you can get this new smart home. And there isn't a big conversation about how to govern the technologies in those smart homes. Okay, Maybe I'll you. just add quickly that like, yeah, I think, quickly. you know, we're also, uh, you know, certainly like, you know, myself and Tracy and Vincent, like we're, because we're in this field, we see the initiatives that the government is taking. And so it's more obvious to us, you know, such as, you know, the work of the multi-stakeholder forum or the open, go open government partnership, you know, the treasury board secretariat's new policy on digital. Uh, and, but, and, and I think even like to say that the digital discussion is so advanced is, is really like, that's so broad. You know, I, I would say that certain parts we're doing better on. And I think at the same time, lots of issues that we need to like continue working on, focusing on. Mm -hmm. Ange? Uh, yeah, so the next question uh, is from an attendee and uh, they say many academic institutions supported sidewalk labs. So did the teacher's pension plan. What happens now? Are those relationships still intact in some vestigial manner? How do we do a post-mortem with those institutions? <laughs> Vinny, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's important to carry on consultations with organizations that have been actively participating in the contested arena of what to do about Keysight. So we continue. What we know now is that Google and Sidewalk Labs are gone and that uh, we have an area that uh, needs development. And really what we need to do is come together and consult on this. But I would also, I, I wanna make a point that can be generalized. Uh, and, and this involves the role of Waterfront Toronto. Um, Waterfront Toronto is a, a public private uh, agency that uh, grew out of a precedent set in New York City 
when it uh, developed the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey as a way to get around democratic governance. In New York City, it was developed by and taken over by Robert Moses to bulldoze through neighborhoods undemocratically across the five boroughs and in the greater New York area. Waterfront Toronto is Toronto's model of this kind of activity, largely backed by real estate development, organizations and the politicians whose campaigns they help to bankroll. Now, I realize that sounds like strong language, but I think it's by and large accurate. Now, what we have to understand and what we're learning, and certainly Tracy will know we're learning this in Ottawa, where we put together a public-private partnership to develop what may very well be the continent's worst oh. transit system uh, in uh, a, a, a multi-billion dollar a train system that simply doesn't work. Now we did it again with uh, out of uh, a public-private partnership, a so-called P3 organization that um, largely defends the interests of the private partners. So the lesson here is that for the future of development uh, in the area that Sidewalk Labs has vacated, we need to be very cautious about making use of organizations whose major purpose is to do an end run around democratic participation and consultation. So put the heat on these organizations, keep the pressure on, and don't resist making demands. So arguments about practicality and efficiency and getting bogged down in bureaucracy, well, these are often arguments that are used to keep democracy and citizens at bay. And we need to resist this in the case of Toronto and elsewhere. But also yep. how many of us know, I don't know about you here, how many of us know about financialization? I don't know much about that. I can tell you, like, oh, I manage my little bank account, but I don't know a lot about financialization or large investment or, or the legalities of PPPs and how that works as an instrument uh, like you're talking about, Vinny. And so, you know, we've been good with technology conversations, more or less, right, uneven as we agreed and openness and all that kind of stuff. It's now it's almost as if we need to bring bankers and financiers mm -hmm. and legal scholars and forensic accountants into our conversations. Because when we see these, these big PPPs coming, whether it be for toll roads in Toronto, whether it be for a uh, sidewalk or whether it be for this outrageous train system that we're not gonna get in Ottawa, we like how do we even have those conversations i don't like i don't know you know rolodex is old school but i don't have this these group of people in my network so yeah. who are these people that we need to bring in yeah. um I, th I think you raise um important points particularly drawing out um other uh actors or other you know government and quasi-governmental actors. Um, Waterfront Toronto obviously has, is a, a key uh, player in the, in the sidewalk case. And I wanna make clear that I do not speak on behalf of, of, uh, mm -hmm. of Waterfront Toronto or um, the Digital uh, Strategy Advisory Panel. Um, I think much of what Vinny, you said um, uh, is pertinent. Um, I suspect, though, that uh, Waterfront Toronto management uh, could only dream of the powers that uh, Robert Moses had in terms of remaking mm -hmm. the, the city. I mean, it has, in some ways, very limited um, powers, but it is, as I think you're pointing out, outside of the regular governmental system, and that, that needs um, some close attention. Um, uh, so um, thank you for that. Um, Ange, um, another, another good question. Uh, yeah, so this is a question for Mariana, for Nabil and Tracy. Uh, given the comments about the limitations of focusing only on whether data sets are open, is there a possibility that Open North might change its name to something like D Democratic Digital North? <laughs> uh, that's a good idea that I will take back to our team. <laughs> to but, the board. Uh, I can't, yeah, I don't think it's a question that I can answer. <laughs> It's, it's part of their mandate, right? I mean, the mandate of Open North, originally it was, it was doing um, open budgets and uh, helping do collaborative budgeting in cities and, and developing those kind of democratic technologies. 
And so at the time when Open North got its name, it was at the time when conversations about open data were happening. But really, you know, if you go look at the mission and the mandate of Open North, it's about deliberative democratic technologies and data and, and transparency and accountability and those things. Um, I like the name that you're suggesting, bit of a mouthful, hard sell, Open North is easy, <laughs> but interesting idea. Okay. Thanks, Marianne, for a question. Angie. Mm -hmm. Ange, sorry. Yes. Uh, so the next question is from Neve. Do you think it was a coincidence that Sidewalk Labs left Toronto a week after CCLA filed its legal briefs in the court? Well, potentially, because I think the CCLA had announced their lawsuit months and months ago. So mm -hmm. it wasn't really oh, news yeah. to Sidewalk Labs that, you know, there would be a, a lawsuit coming. Um, I think... Uh, but I don't know. Uh, you know, I I'm not privy to to that. But I I think that it was quite well known that PCLA was going to launch a lawsuit. They had announced it months ago. Yeah, I mean, I suspect, um, and not knowing much of the details, but I suspect that the scale of the um, proposed uh, judicial review may have um, have have given Sidewalk um, some pause. Um, it will be very hard to tell what the, 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 all the contributors to their decision are. Um, I, my, I, suspicion, my, I suspect that there was a, a, a confluence of, of, of factors at, at that time and that uh, COVID was the convenient um, mm -hmm. reason, but um, not to say that it wasn't important, but um, it would be a very interesting sort of forensic uh, study, I think, to look at, um, at what brought uh, sidewalk in and and then um, what uh, took it out and um, we've yeah, uh, had know, some uh, comments on that. Uh, I think it's, uh, it is it, it will be difficult to make a final determination but I think we have to understand that uh, I, uh, that sidewalk labs was generally taken aback by the extent of the opposition after all it got its start in New York City uh, Dan Doktoroff was deputy mayor under Michael Bloomberg, where he pretty well had free reign uh, to uh, redevelop uh, New York City. And uh, he ultimately moved over to, to Google and took over Sidewalk Labs and, and uh, by and large could uh, experiment uh, whether it was the free Wi-Fi system in, in, in New York or a bunch of other projects without much uh, resistance. And uh, moving up here, I think having the support of all levels of government at the start, it anticipated uh, a pretty uh, clear uh, uh, a direction to uh, its, its goal of redeveloping and using Toronto as a a test uh, market for smart cities. So uh, I think uh, we, 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 it's important not to uh, underestimate uh, the importance of the genuine resistance. And uh, my sense is that was an important component of their decision here. Good, um, Ange. Uh, yeah, so uh, another attendee asks, can we learn anything from China's cities such as Wuhan and Shanghai to improve our systems of participation? Uh, it depends what you mean by participation. I mean, people were told what to do in Wuhan. Um, and there, a lot of apparatuses were put into play to control movement, to control communication, to control uh, systems. There's a massive infrastructure uh, put in by Tencent and, and WeChat and other major big tech infrastructure companies that have a very close relationship with the People's Republic of China um, in terms of governing those, those tools and those systems. So I don't think there was much participation but force uh, control in the context of Wuhan, which, you know, may be quite right. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to judge another place's governing model. Uh, but if, if the learning is to say you can't force big tech on people in the context of here, well, maybe what we will learn is that encouraging engagement, public participation, conversation, 
uh, deliberative democracy and designing systems that are open, transparent and accountable and fair and just in a transdisciplinary way with public engagement might lead us to uh, a better conversation about how we govern technologies. And I think a lot of it is the governing of the technologies and the governing of the data and the collaboration between institutions. You have, I see Nabil nodding there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a quick comment because it's an interesting, like I think the question reveals uh, a tendency in, in our conversations around smart cities to like, to imagine that, you know, maybe we're under the same governing framework. But, mm -hmm. but in fact, you know, China is a totally different kind of political entity than Canada, or it, even for example, even Canada and the U.S. are not comparable. And I think that's that's part of what you know Dan Doctorov's experience was. New York City and Toronto are entirely different landscapes when you think about how decisions are made. And uh, you know, we often hear about uh, you know GDPR, for instance. How can we apply GDPR to Canada? And 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 actually, the European Union has a different legacy and a different history of how they think about, has, has a different conception of individuals and society and, and civil liberties and, civil, and, and human rights compared to you know, North America. And I think understanding the distinct differences is important, but at the same time, I think we can definitely learn something from, from global experiences, which is something that Vincent has done a lot in his book, highlight different examples and, and I think we can agree that, you know, in terms of the outcomes, there are certain outcomes that are preferable uh, to some of the prevailing outcomes, right? So certainly we do want to ensure that, you know, we think about consent uh, and, and don't just order people around. Uh, and I think that that's, that's an example of, you know, uh, something that we can learn. There are many other kind of uh, examples that we can name as well. Yeah, I mean, Denise, the, the, yeah. You, you're, you have a position uh, in Shanghai, don't you? So you have some um, more direct experience than most yeah, of us. I've spent a fair bit of time in, in, in China um, across the country. And, you know, there are about a thousand smart city projects around the world. Uh, half of them, about 500, are in China. Uh, and there is a great deal of variety in these projects from renewing older cities like Shanghai to building entirely new ones from the ground up. Um, some are more environmentally conscious, uh, others are more uh, surveillance intensive. Um, what I think China is beginning to learn that it, it, it needs to tap into to a much greater degree than it has in the past, the wisdom of its people. That is to, to, to make smart cities work effectively it can't simply use top-down methods. At the same time, those of us in the West have to understand that the, China's not operating from one simple or simplistic playbook, that there is a lot of variety, there is a great deal of contention in, in the development of cities, uh, and that it is making progress in areas that we are only beginning uh, to, to benefit from. Uh, one very specific example in my memory is taking a high-speed train from Shanghai to Wuhan. And uh, the thing that struck me the most perhaps was the train zipping through villages along the way and on the roofs of most of the houses, however poor, were solar panels oh, wow. handed out by the government to change the distribution of energy in this vast terrain uh, from Eastern to Central uh, China. And you find this across the country. So there is a lot to be learned from the Chinese experience. And I think the Chinese uh, as well are beginning to, uh, to learn from ours. We just have to look to Hong Kong protests, right? The smartest, most technologically savvy protesters in the world are in Hong Kong. And so the people who are deploying the fastest, the biggest, the best types of technologies, whether it be big computing, blockchain, fast trains, whatever it might be, cities that show up overnight, hospitals that are built in three days. You know, there's a lot to learn from China, but there's also, let's not underestimate Chinese people and let's not underestimate the, dem the democratic engagement. It, let's not... I won't, I won't say democratic engagement. Let's not underestimate the civic engagement of individual 
Chinese people in ways that we can't see because we don't have access to the language and access to the media streams that are there. But Hong Kong, if Hong Kong is anything, woohoo, we have lots to learn from them, from individual citizens in China. And. Uh, yeah, so I have another one from Simon. Can you give an example of technology successfully extending civic engagement, engagement and overcoming existing social barriers in a society that does not have a history of democratic institutions? I mean, it depends what, I mean, transport, public transportation, right? Shared transportation is a, is a really interesting one. You can have a, a shared transportation system that's a community transportation system, or you can have one, you know, that's more concentrated and, and more centralized. Uh, you can have, there's, there's so many different health systems around the world. There's so different, so many different uh, case management systems around the world. I think it's, it, it depends what kind of technology you want to talk about in what kind of context and what kind of application. I don't think it's a, it's that easy to make a, uh, an easy generalization. You know, when we look, when we develop the smart city guide and, and in Vincent's book, you see very clearly, right? There's places like Barcelona. We saw places that said that we're only going to procure technologies that are not made from slave labor and other places. They said, uh, we're going to develop this, this underlying open source infrastructure, you know, Estonia and other places like that upon which other things are going to be built. Or just even think of the context of the, this outbreak. You know, what's going on is that we can't translate New Zealand to Canada. It's an island with 3 million people, right? <laughs> we have this vast continental context with this massive coastline with 30, you know, close to 40 million people. And then you go, you know, et cetera. So it really, it's really dependent on the specificities and the, and the contexts of different places. Yeah, I was racking my head to think about an example, but I was also trying to think about like what society does not have a history of democratic institutions globally. You know, I think I think, you know, you know, we've named authoritarian societies today, but even they have some history of you know democratic participation. Uh, I think you know, people assert and have always been asserting their rights, uh, their political voice uh, in around the world. But I mean, just to you know to answer, I mean, I just thought of something that may not be a great example, but bear with me, which is maybe you could, I think we need to also, this is something we can do is broaden our conception of what does technology mean? It doesn't necessarily mean something that is digital. It doesn't necessarily mean mm -hmm. something that, you know, runs on the internet or on electricity. Um, the Underground Railroad is, is, was a technology that mm -hmm. overcame existing social barriers mm -hmm. in, uh, in America under slavery. That's an example that I can think of. Our electrical grid system that I just brought up or the traffic management system, or just think of our 911 system when you call an ambulance. I mean, those are other forms of technologies that are you know, the underpinning of civilized societies to take care of their own, if you will, and it, our water infrastructure system. And, you know, and we've seen what happens if we don't pay attention to that. Because we, we have examples of that where, you know, we failed the inspection systems and so on, and how we have to continuously relearn. But these underlying infrastructures that we have are pretty incredible, complicated and complex infrastructures. Yeah, I mean, in addition to, to raising questions about the meaning of technology, we also need to question the definition of an institution. Uh, to, to ask about whether a country has a history of democratic institutions well, are we referring to formal governance structures, or are we looking at the way informally neighborhoods come together uh, and uh, provide uh, advice, pressure, resistance to those formal authorities? This happens all the time in China, frankly. Mm -hmm. we, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, contrary to the view that everything in this country of 1.4 billion people is centrally controlled, and even assuming that it can be controlled. There is a great deal of daily ongoing resistance, protest, uh, and the movement of ideas up and down the hierarchies that exist in, in the country. I see it firsthand uh, when I visit, and I'm hoping to contribute to it by showing the video of our discussion here and a course I'm teaching in Fudan uh, this summer on smart cities. It'll be online. 
I'll share the comments of our, our panelists uh, with students at Fudan University in Shanghai and elicit their views about the ways in which uh, change takes place uh, within countries that may or may not have a history of democratic institutions. Well, we're, we're close to running out of time. So if you're out there and you have a burning question, um, you know, the, the hour and a half has gone by quickly. Um, uh, get your questions in um, now and um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can, uh, we can address them. So, um, Ange, another question. Uh, yes, yeah, so the next question is from Lenny. Uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic that is changing everything in our lives. What can we learn from this for our consideration of smart cities? where to start, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we forgot to wash our hands. Like that's kind of a basic thing that, you know, that we learned that, you know, with C. difficile, for instance, in hospitals, that even nurses and doctors were forgetting to wash their hands. So we're learning about all of that right now. If there's one thing that I am really learning is that, you know, institutions and organizations forget stuff. And that this process of what we're doing, you know, with this, 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 aspect of talking about technology, talking about data, talking about institutions, talking about democracy. My son had this great bumper sticker, forget your rights and they disappear, right? Canadians are pretty good at forgetting their rights. Uh, uh, and also, you know, we have also learned that we forgot basic social science and social determinants of health. You know, we, we, we chased shiny little things like technology and all of those things. And we forgot elder care in our nursing homes, for goodness sakes. We forgot all these part-time workers that are moving between one institution into another at minimum wage to try and make like a 40 hour work week are the ones who are transmitting the illness by no fault of their own, right? We forgot that we forgot, you know, Vinny knows this more than any of us here because he's been looking at cities for longer than any of us, that we, we lack public spaces and open spaces which are part of our health and well-being. You know, I think one of the things that we had in the definition of open smart cities was this is our habitat. Our cities are our habitat. And if they're our habitat, how do we live in them better? And how do we design them better so that they help us become better people at the end of the day? What about health and well-being? So if anything, we all have to go back and roll up our sleeves and do some serious thinking about the social sciences, about social determinants of health, about inequality and inequity, about how our institutions were blindsided. I was on a call with the Americas two weeks ago, and they were saying, how are things going in Canada? And I'm saying, oh, listen, 30 countries in Latin America, we just called the military in, in our two provinces, to take care of our elders because we forgot to inspect the homes, right? Or, you know, so we have so much soul searching to do as a result of this. And if, you know, contact tracing is gonna teach us a lot about how we're gonna deliberate those things, let alone the lack of data trail, the lack of standardization in terms of how we've, we've counted people, we, we haven't kept demographics. Anyway, as you can see, I'm very emotional about this topic. It's something I've been paying attention to and I've been looking at, and I am astonished, quite frankly, and I will say the proverbial we, how stupid we've been and how uncaring we have been that has brought us to this point. Yes, we've seen all kinds of great little things happening here and there, but we shouldn't have had to. We shouldn't have, we should not have been having old people dying in our homes, in our nursing homes, and we shouldn't have been neglecting the poor, people who are homeless, people from different equity groups and our elders, let alone our institutions and even basic, you know, the standards that Nabil and others have been working on are completely not being applied when it comes to chief medical officers of health and how we're reporting on these things. So clearly one institution learns and another one comes up as we saw with health and it hasn't learned uh, from the basic standards that we thought we had set up. So I think we've got so much to learn. Thanks for that question. Yeah, I mean, it really shouldn't take a pandemic to bring about the kind of social change we all exactly. need. Exactly. But historically, in fact, it has. I mean, we wouldn't have the great parks and public spaces, including one of my favorites in the world, Central Park in Manhattan, if it weren't for a pandemic. Now, I tend to look on the positive side of this and say, all right, we have an opportunity. There's lots that we need to do. People today are rethinking cities as a result of the current pandemic. 
well, let's rethink them the right way. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the need for public space, for sidewalks, for fewer cars, for public participation in decision making with politicians who got the pandemic wrong. Let's learn to, uh, to trust ourselves more, to help each other more than we have in the past, and to develop the social movements that we need to remake uh, our cities. We have an opportunity to do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah. Uh, add quickly before we move on to the next. Yes, well, I, I we're, think we're wrapping I'm, up here, uh, Nabil, so. Um, go for it, the Nabil. last word. Uh, I was reading uh, an article somewhere that, you know, according to like traditional indicators, the US was the most well-equipped government in the world to deal with the pandemic. Okay. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, despite having technological superiority, despite the institutions and structures, they haven't been able to do well. And I think what this indicates first is that, you know, like our indicators aren't good enough. There was an article early on in the CDC saying, you know, this is the first data-driven pandemic. And there's a lot that we've been able to do in terms of like data sharing, but there's a lot that we need to continue building on. Um, and I think I want to like add on to what Vincent is saying that, you know, I think this is really uh, highlighting again that, you know, the importance of public spaces. And I think now we're recognizing the public spaces are increasingly online. You know, this is a public space. The conversation we're having is part of something that would have happened in a tea shop 100 years ago. And I think this brings back to concepts such as the right to the city and remembering that, you know, Tracy, you said that, you know, Canadians forget about their rights. Well, some Canadians never forgot, but they were silenced and deliberately unheard. Also, uh, from the yes. I says, right? Exactly. And I think how can we support those conversations is, uh, is really important. Okay, well, there's a lot more that we could say in this conversation, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So I want to thank you um, all, uh, Nabil, Tracy, and, uh, and, and Vinny, and um, uh, people out there watching, and I'll just turn it over to Jim for a final word. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. I also want to, on behalf of the Center for Free Expression and the audience, thank all four of you for a, a really enlightening, vibrant, uh, informative discussion. Uh, and I'd like to uh, advise the audience to remember that uh, the Center for Free Expression is holding uh, a panel discussion like this every week for the next uh, month or two. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the next one is going to be a week today, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And the topic is, who is afraid to speak of genocide? Perspectives on reclaiming power and place, the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Uh, we're going to have a series of other, one, uh, other panel discussions. You can see all of them listed on the Center for Free Expression website, which is cfe.ryerson.ca. Again, thank you all very much for joining us today, and I hope to see some of you next week. Bye-bye. Goodbye and thank you. And sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Yeah.